Welcome to Trail Red TV. My name is Ian McNay, and today we're going to talk about the monochrome set. And we have in the studio Bid. Hello, uh, Bid. And Bid, of course, is the one of the founders and the singer, the leader, if you like, of the monochrome set. And I guess Bid, we need to start way back with the B sides. Um, yes, I guess so. The, uh, uh, the B-sides were the, were, were the band that uh, the monochrome set and Adam and the Ants sprang from. And um, it, it was really Andy Warren, Adam Ant, Leicester Square. And for a shortish time, well, the B-sides weren't very long-lived anyway, but for a shortish time, I was in the band. So uh, that came out of Hornsey College of Art, is um, that right? Lester and, and Adam went to Hornsey College of Art, I think, and uh, Andy and I were at school together, right. so we had grown up in school bands, and he joined the B-Sides answering an advertisement for a bass player, and I, I sort of joined a little bit later with the idea that I would be the rhythm guitar player and Adam would just sing, because he, he played guitar as well. But virtually all the songs, I think, were written by Adam, so I was just... I'd only really just started writing songs at that time. And what kind of age were you then? <laughs> yeah, I must have been 17. Right, or yeah. And going on to 18. And had you sung at all, or you just playing guitar? No. Well, I mean, you know, yes, actually, in, in the school bands, I was doing a bit of singing, and we were writing stupid songs. Uh, not serious, new wave, groundbreaking, whatnots. Um, so what kind of songs did you write then? You say stupid <laughs> songs, love songs or...? No, just just kind of, I, I can't think really, just uh, I suppose velvety, rock and rolly right, type yeah. of things, you know. Um, and that band was the first serious band, if you like, and Adam um, became ill and uh, went off for a while, and we, we uh, Lester, Andy and I carried on for a bit, not really calling ourselves anything particularly, because we didn't really know what was happening. But we'd, we then started writing, and I started writing seriously, especially with uh, Lester's influence, who's been a, who was a very big influence in my early writing. Um, and that was at the time when I was writing songs like um, He's Frank and Goodbye Joe, which would go on later records. Um, and a few months later, Adam became well again and decided he was no longer Stuart Goddard and he was now Adam Ant. And he's, he formed the Ants and Lester and, and Andy went off to join him. I wasn't asked. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sort of carried on and, and played with a, a few other people. And then some months later, Lester left the Ants. For what reason, I, I don't exactly know. Um, uh, and we formed the monochrome set. After a couple of like stuttering starts, we formed right. the monochrome set at the beginning of 1978, and that was that was the time when the Art Attacks were a punk band, rather art school punk band. I remember them, yeah. Um, Edwin Pouncey, Savage Pencil, the, the cartoonist, and J.D. Haney were in the band, the drummer, and J.D. Haney joined us, and then we had another bass player. So that was the start of the monochrome set. We're, you know, it was impossible to say every band that people start in those days, you think, well, this is going to be it, we're going to go on for 20 years and make millions. So the two bands that we had previous to that, we thought the same about it. So we didn't really have any plans, particularly. We just started writing and carrying on. But it was very important to get J.D. in. J.D.'s an ex extremely intelligent, um, creative person. Unusual for a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> um... And uh, that kind of intellectual rigour was really the, the sort of foundation of the monochrome set, the idea that we'd be doing something different. So it's, where does the name come from? The monochrome set, yeah. it was just, um, I don't really know, I think, you know, it was apart from the black and white television, there was Eve Klein's monochrome symphony and just the sort of... The, the fashion of the late 60s, you either had hippie or you had, like, black and white check... Um, op art and we were sort of I don't I don't know why do people call themselves anything it just seemed to us like a nice name um, then we just started yeah. and and uh, we actually started um, rehearsing in a, in a squat in Brixton 
which is where we found our first manager, who was living in the same squad as J.D. Haney. In those days, of course, it was very easy to be in bands because you go to our college and you were paid to go to college in those days. You didn't have to pay. Not only that, it was very easy to find squats in London to live for free. Yes. So yeah. art school students all joined bands. And then yeah. for the last week of their three-year course, they'd go in and do a painting and get, get their degree. So the three years previous to that, they were in bands. <clears throat> Personally, I think it's a sound social <laughs> investment because we ended up uh, getting a fair bit of... Uh, um, exports out of out of new wave and punk i think anyway um we rehearsed a, a squad in brixton and that's where we met tony potts who was living there and our first manager and tony potts right. kind of became a fifth member of the modern cram set um he was at chelsea school of art studying film and he had a load of film and we just said i think in the fifth or sixth gig that we did why don't you just bring your projectors down or borrow some projectors and and just um show your rubbish <laughs> over 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 us and uh that was our light show and that's which at the time was quite unique wasn't it well i think that nobody had done it since the velvets i mean it wasn't completely unique but but no no nobody else was doing it at the time later yeah. on the the human league um didn't do that they used slides but pretty much the human league or us weren't we were the only people doing that sort of thing so um yeah that, that's kind of how the, the early period started. And in those days, unlike now, um, you could do 10 gigs, and within 10 gigs, you'd have 100 hardcore fans in London. It was fairly easy to get gigs um, in a different way. Nowadays, it's, it's sort of easy to get gigs because you go on the internet and you can search for all the clubs in blah, blah, blah. In those days, you kind of had to know. So it was very difficult to get gigs in Europe. But in London, if you used your brains, you could think, well, there's loads of colleges in London, they've all got social secretaries, I'm just going to ring them all up, which I did every day. So Spend, you were actually doing the booking yourself? I was spending hours on the phone saying, yeah. hello, mate, yeah. we've got a tape, do you want to book us? And um, there, there was money in this country then, so that uh, uh, there were 20 or 30 even teacher training colleges in London that you just rung up and you spoke to the, the poor idiot who'd been made social secretary for that year and he didn't know what to do and he just said well book us so that's how we got some of our gigs and the other gigs we got were clubs and it wasn't very long before we had our own hardcore following and um i mean there was there was uh, you know we were going to see other bands other bands were coming to see us but the exciting thing about that period is that um before it became a genre before punk became a genre and sections of new wave became a genre pretty much every band was different um with the psychedelic first started not that long ago after that and butler asked me to be the lead singer and you know oh really you know, well, yeah. not yeah. after he stepped on my toes i said no um and uh, what the pleasers who are a sort of punk beatles band yeah they're almost like a beatles tribute band that's with, right yeah. Way, yeah with a sort of new wave hard edge to them yeah, or something yeah. but it was kind of acceptable that you just have this wide flowering of of music yeah. the sort of breaking away from the overt uh instrumental um excellence of people like genesis and yes and led zeppelin just like just playing fun music very simple beat pop if you like um was that part of your appeal do you think the kind of the lightness and the simplicity well it didn't it didn't really stay sort of simple because we, we were a little bit complex i mean some of the new wave bands were complicated but in a different way to the kind of the early 70s pop rock bands it was complex in a in a sort of um slightly more avant-garde juddering way uh not unpleasant but i mean some people forget that the first one or two blondie albums were, were semi-experimental pop and they were very very good but it was a kind of experimentation with yeah with things everyone was experimenting with you know let's throw this this other stuff out and let's just try a few things again um <clears throat> so people were try experimenting with scar people were experimenting with with garage late 60s american garage which turned into 
uh, late 70s UK punk. Um, so obviously the Stooges and, and uh, Lou Reed had an influence over that. Um, but it was quite easy to get gigs in London, quite a lot of gigs in, in London and to a degree the UK. Um, and before long you'd, you'd get reviewed in one of the three or three and a half papers, weekly papers. There was it. Disc, Record Mirror, Sounds, Melody Maker, and Enemy. 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 Five, Enemy. So, oh, so. Well, we didn't really think of Disc. I mean, we considered it was three and a half because Record Mirror was like half serious. Yes. <laughs> you know, you yeah. sort of half take it seriously. But, um, yeah, you, you'd, you'd get reviewed and, you know... And that meant something then, it, didn't it? It did mean something, yeah. yeah. And, and we got very good reviews and we picked up a lot of audience and actually by the end of that first year we were signed by, by Jeff Travis at Rough Trade. And it was fairly easy to do that, you know, fairly easy to get record deals. So how did you actually get the deal? Did you send a tape into Rough Trade? He, or he, no, I play? don't know who... I think that he just... He hadn't been asked or anything. He just turned up at um, Ronnie Scott's, upstairs at Ronnie Scott's one day. And he just used to, I suppose, go around checking bands out, um, you know, who started making a bit of a name for themselves. And he virtually offered us a deal there and then. Right. Um, at least it was either there or, there or within a week of seeing us. So um, just for, for a sort of loose -ish deal, you know, for one single, see how it does, another single, whatever, you know. Um, so we did that, and, and in the second year, in 1979, we released three singles. So it's He's Frank, I'm a Symphony, and the Monochrome set. So that's the three. And the response to the first single, He's Frank, was a pretty decent response. It's very it? good, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, you had the commercial charts and you had the indie charts. So He's Frank, uh, all three singles, I think, were in the top ten yes, of the indie charts. Yeah. And yeah, the, the, the very first review that we had was John C Cooper Clark's Single of the Week. And that sort of, that's us, arrived, at least on the indie scene, you know. Yeah, again, single of the week in one of the, one of the weekly yeah, papers at that time sure. gave you a really big boost. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you could say it's, it's kind of difficult because it was, you could look back on it and say having just the three uh, papers that you had to try to impress was restrictive, but it did give a focus. Nowadays, yeah. you, know, you, you want to listen to something new, where do you go? My space, you go to Drowned in Sound, I don't, you know, I don't really know where to go to. A lot of people write to me and say that they don't exactly know where to go. There isn't really a, a central forum or a focus. It's almost too many alternatives, it's, isn't it? It's too many. Yeah. You know, it's my, maybe healthy, maybe not healthy, yeah. because you just end up not knowing where the good bands are. You do need some guidance, I think, people. So you did, the, as you say, you did the three singles mm. for, for Rough Trade, and then you, in fact, was, in fact, I'm looking at the discography here. Technically speaking, there's it was four, four because there's his Frank slight return. Slight was. return was the demo, um, and I think we actually, before we signed to Rough Trade, we paid for that. We recorded the demo of his Frank. I'm not sure if we paid for it ourselves or did Rough Trade pay for it. I think we did did it ourselves. I'm not sure. Uh, Jeff will tell me probably in three weeks time um, we paid for that recording uh, uh, we recorded that as a demo and then later on it was such a good recording uh, but we re-recorded re the song for Rough Trade we released that after we had signed with Dindisc but we released it with, with Dindisc permission kind of thing um, on Rough Trade yeah. and what's the reason you left Rough Trade who obviously done quite well with your first well Dave, singles. Dave Fudger was a, was a journalist in sounds who was a bit of a fan of ours. He joined this new company called Dindisc who have found um, a kind of a sub-label of... It's backed Virgin, by Virgin, yeah. Virgin Records, yeah. yeah. Um, and he joined them as the A&R guy. And he wanted to take us there. He approached us. And we had actually been kind of ready or planning to do our first album on Rough Trade. And it has to be said that um, it wasn't that the offer was, was so good with Dindisc or anything. It wasn't, I don't think it, it was better than the Rough Trade offer, but it was kind of, it felt the better thing to do. In a sense with Rough Trade, I think that by then, 
we didn't we felt right with rough trade itself and with all the people that were working with rough trade and we really liked all the people there but we felt slightly not part of the stable so that we didn't really feel ourselves as a rough trade band that the other bands on rough trade at the time were weren't were sufficiently different to us i mean the paradox is that we're we're probably more different to you know, fry, frying pan into the fire we signed with, with Dindisk and then we're on a label with Orchestral Minerals in the Dark and Martha and the Muffins and blah, blah, blah. So we're not really like Martha and the Muffins yeah. either. But I don't know why we just went with Dindisk. It, it, Dindisk, it felt possibly that we'd get further, maybe with Dindisk. Yeah. It would just be a bit more kind of... Seems like a career um, moving one way. In a sense, because sort of Rough Trade just felt disorganized in many yeah. ways and they were disorganized let's face it they were really really nice yeah but i mean they had to renegotiate their contracts with all their bands because they were giving them 50 percent royalties uh, it, was, it was way too generous so right. so yeah. so yeah. and and it was just mayhem at rough yeah. trade every day when yeah. you go in there it was just like pff, cardboard everywhere really yeah. so it was you know when a, a, a dind is backed by a virgin you felt okay let's yeah. go with that one you know, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. We were ambitious, or that we were going. We felt we were going to get in the top ten, or we were going to get our teeth done, or anything like that. It just felt like it was okay. Let's move yeah. on. You know. So, and then you had the, Jack Strange Boutique. Yeah, which got in the top seventy-five. Uh, I mean, a lot charts. of people are, uh, point out why is a band like the Monochrome Set never become more successful? Uh, and the thing is that the first two albums didn't really have any singles on them. And despite all the revolution, and despite the this, and the, despite the that, the music business still worked on singles, uh, at least to get to the to the stratospheric level of of being a star, or being in the top ten, or being in the top twenty. It was only a short period of time in English musical, modern musical history that you could be a successful album band like Yes or Led Zeppelin or whatever, and not release a single, not get into the top ten. And those days had already gone. So you couldn't really, you know, you had to release something that the radios could play. And there wasn't really anything on the first two albums. There were albums and there were great albums. Um, but it wasn't really until uh, we joined Cherry Red and we made Jet Set Junta that, that we would start. We're trying. More. Yeah. So w w when you wrote songs before, had you got in mind, I'd like to... That you'd like to write a really commercial single, or were you just no, writing? No, I mean the, the only time we've ever done that in the history of the monochrome set is when I rewrote the lyrics to Jacob's Ladder and made right. them not obscene because <laughs> they were originally, yeah. um, and uh, so that was it. You know, yeah. the, 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 we, we had we kind of became a little bit disillusioned which is stupid to be disillusioned because in retrospect we were putting out the wrong things to be commercially successful. But the odd thing about that um, early period and if you like our, our disillusionment with the, with the music business is that by about 1981, we'd, we'd done the first two albums in, in 1980 and by 1981 Dindisk was pretty much wound up yeah. and we were dropped. Yeah. So we ended up... At the, around about the beginning of 1981 without a record company. I think around about that time, Susie and the Banshees were without a record company as well. And we were the two biggest unsigned bands in the UK. We could play places like Dundee or Blackpool or Cleethorpes and we'd pack the place out. We'd get 10 times as many people who were in the singles chart, top 10 singles yes, charts, but yeah. neither of us were signable bands. Yeah. No, band, no record company would touch us. So that, that's the commercialization had happened very, very quickly. They didn't want to know, and that's a paradox to me, because being uh, already having become a bit of a rocker, to me, live audience meant sales, long-term growth, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But no, the companies were only interested in singles and um, that kind of what has be, what what I think destroyed the companies during the course of the nineties, a lot of them like RCA went bust because of just the mentality of throwing a hundred grand at a band. 
and uh, it, a single not getting anywhere, rather than thinking in, in the way that Cherry Red have been thinking, and the, this is why you've been keeping going for so long, is, is to be clever with your money and actually think long term. You know, you know yeah. go with music and go with bands that are actually going to be selling and going to be going internationally for a long period of time rather than just, you know, let's go for radio play and radio Bristol. Or something. Yeah, it was, it was a time of, <coughs> um, of hit singles then um, mm. and hit singles sold lots of copies. Yeah, they did. And, yeah. it, and, almost, and it didn't mean to say if you had, had hit singles, you sold albums. Some yeah. bands did, some bands didn't. Well, the, I mean, the only problem, as I'd say about that, is that hit singles brought with them their own problems of finances. Is you had a hit single, you were inevitably going to have to cough up at least 30 grand for a video. Then you'd have to cough up more for the next album, and you know, the next album the band will want to record it. Yeah, that's the right, the Bermuda that's really, yeah. and that sort of thing. So yeah. it kind of, if you go down that road, then, then costs really mount and they go out of proportion, which might have brought down companies like Stiff or whatever. They had a bit of hits, and then the costs went spiraled out of control, I think, for them. Anyway, you, yeah. you just to keep it on sequence yeah. here, then you did a single for pre records, which is part of Charisma. Yeah. Pre records were a kind of um, sub label to Charisma in the same way that Dindisk were to Virgin. Yeah. They were even, uh, they didn't last as long as Dindisk even. I'm not really too sure if they put out any albums, just, just a handful of singles, and they just went under. They weren't the right label for us at all. Yeah. And by then already we didn't know how to, what position we were in the market because New Wave had virtually already gone and now we're, you, were, you started getting the neuromantics and the kind of heavy commercialism started getting kind of the new romantic disco music and culture club and all that kind of thing which, which would come in a year. So you felt you were getting a little bit left behind with the, with the modern trends, did um, you? I wouldn't say, I, I would say that we were kind of carrying on the new wave ideal. Yes, but I mean, you were getting left behind in the kind of terms of the popularity of what was happening. Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not too sure. I, I rather think that the rest of the country were sort of regressing <laughs> <laughs> back to savagery okay. yeah. rather than us being left behind. But, uh, yeah, we kind of, um, we, we pretty much split up, I think. Um, John decided to go to America permanently at the end of 81, uh, J.D. Haney. Uh, Lester went off to a teacher training course and Andy and I didn't really know what to do. We, we did a, a demo for Do It Records and... Of course, was, Adam and the Ants started on Do It Records, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. So, so he already knew the guys at yeah. Do It. Um, and the demo at Do It Records uh, sort of led to the deal with Cherry Red. Did, did you just, just, to, just to put a point in there, did you, but by this time Adam had got huge with the ants. Yeah. Did you feel some regret at all that he'd become so successful? I should actually mention that, that uh, just before we, we recorded Strange Boutique, that the ants had actually split up and Andy didn't have a band and at that time we had just sacked our bass player so we asked Andy to join and that was in around about no November 79 right. and he was asked to um, after he'd already joined us and, and recorded Strange Boutique he was asked to go back and uh, I can't remember I think possibly he was asked to go back but he was, uh, to the Ants but he was definitely asked to join, join Bow Wow Wow and he, he'd turned them both down yeah. stayed with them on a grim set Thought we were going to be bigger. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's I don't know. Um, no, absolutely not. When you see, you know, that's kind of like Andy didn't go with Bow Wow Wow for the reason that he didn't want to dress up and look like a prat. Yeah. And that's actually, you know, so if you don't want to do that, you can't be jealous of someone who does it. Yeah. It, it's the music business has always been two businesses running side by side, and that's commercialism and art, and you get extremes of both, and they're not better or worse than each other. They're just you know they're different, and if if you you can be if you've got a mod modicum of of, of uh, creative ability, you can be very very successful if you're also ambitious and willing to 
suppress parts of yourself. Um, and I wasn't. Yeah. So I wasn't going to do that. You know. So anyway, you ended up at Cherry Red. And the yeah. rumour was there, you started working From through a, a directory of record companies, A, B and C. That's exactly Ringing it. them all up, is that really true? Yeah, yeah. You got, got to Cherry Red and... and then Somebody got, answered the phone and yeah. so <laughs> knew who you were. That, that's, that's actually it. We had, we had this, Andy had acquired this book of punk or indie labels and we just started at A and worked our way through. Uh. And we got to C and it was, or CH, Cherry Red, there you go. And then within a week, or we already had the demo, the do-it demo, and within a week or two of that, the um, um, deal was essentially done. And they, there you have it, yeah. And your first single was The Mating Game, wasn't it? Yeah. Cherry Red. Probably not a very good which wasn't <laughs> single to release. Which was a fun single, and, and mm. I, said, I remember it got some good press, but... Jet Set would have been a better single, probably, at the time. Well, yeah, it wasn't so commercial. No. Yeah. But then when the Jet Set was finally released... Uh, uh, Britain was in war with Argentina. <laughs> the Falklands War was on, and the jet set was banned by a couple of radio stations anyway. At least it got jet noticed. Set and, yeah. you know, so yeah. there you go, our luck. But uh, I think that by then, that was a kind of cusp point between two eras. One which was the, I'd almost say that the um, the new wave era that that we joined was really. Although you can't associate it with the hippie era, it is, you know, by time, part of that era of the 70s. It was a reaction to the hippie era, so it is part of it. And Cherry Red was really the beginning, I think, of modern indie pop. I think that Cherry Red are pretty much, if not one of the first companies, the first company to actually put out indie pop records. I think the Jet Set Junta was a huge influence on certain parts of indie pop, especially the Swedish indie pop scene, which was, uh, you know, that kind of thing was kind of just starting then. Um, or it, perhaps even it, it wasn't starting then, perhaps it, it didn't start for a few years after that. But uh, I think it was a fantastic something and Kleenex and, and the, the Eligible Bachelors album was a huge influence on, possibly influence on people like Bell and Sebastian who would then influence the, the melodic indie pop yes, scene. Yeah. That, lasted for so long. So that was a cusp of, a, of two different eras. So again, um, you felt you were having <coughs> influence, but of course... Well, we, we didn't know at the time that we were going to have that sort of... But reality, there wasn't really the sales there, was there? No. I mean, I mean that album got uh, a lot of good reviews, but, yeah. you know, it wasn't... We were just the wrong sound at the wrong time, uh. really, you know. And then... Um, and then that, that was probably, with the record company, the period of sort of late 82, early 83, was the happiest time I've ever spent. Um, it was an amazingly relaxing time. Everyone was, was, you know, a lot of fun to be with. And then it kind of all went a bit crazy when, um, when Pillows and Prayers happened and when everything, everything with the girls started getting attention. And the big boys started sniffing around, and other people started doing things. And of course, it was Blanco and Agro on Warriors. Yeah, so yeah. what happened was, just to, just to fill the details in, Pillows and Prayers was a compilation mm. of 17 artists on Trey Red, yeah. which sold at 99p, mm. which Michael Way, who signed you to Trey Red, put together. And that was a huge success, number one in the indie charts for mm. many months. And it, it got people really aware of the artists on Trey Red. Mm. And, uh, yeah, uh, there's some other artists that were beginning to get, you know, beginning to, to break through. And Michael, in the end, was, was tempted by the kind of Warner Brothers situation, mm. big checkbook, and, mm. and the chance of really, he felt, breaking through bands in a big way. And you, you went with uh, his new setup. I with, just went with the money. <laughs> went with the money. <laughs> well, you're honest. Um, Jeff, Jeff Travis was involved with that as well, wasn't he? I think, you see, the problem, uh, that was a mistake from our point of view, and it was a mistake for Fantastic Something as well. It was only a, not a mistake for, for perhaps everything but the girls. Yes. It was virtually yeah. the only band, I think, that, Warner, uh, that Blanco signed that, that was maybe the right signing for them. I think virtually everyone else was wrong. It was really... Um, uh, it was just psychological because there, there'd always been the, the, the thought that you could actually make a living out of it. So, so 
um, the thought of actually just selling more records and doing more gigs and just and not not being an international star or anything, but just getting more money and just making a living at it, so that you wouldn't have to, blah blah blah, you know, work at a record shop uh, in the, at night and stuff like that. Wouldn't have to put your own gigs yeah. and everything. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was it was a mistake. It was a mistake, but it was kind of understandable for all those bands, I think, probably to make a mis that mistake. Well, maybe you had well. to do it to find out. You often don't know with things, I, do you? I guess so. And, you know, but Warners, were, you know, didn't know what to do with these bands. They had no idea how to deal with Jacob's Ladder, the record. It was, um, th there was no coordination at all. The, the in-house plugger started plugging it um, very hard. A few weeks before it was released so it got major radio play for two weeks and by the end of the two weeks it still hadn't been released and the day D DJs were saying well this isn't gonna sell let's stop playing it you know yeah. and then it was released great and then a few weeks after that they decided let's make a video so that that's the way Warner's I mean for all the the the, the size of the company and the money floating around they had no idea what to do yeah, lack coordination yeah, by the sound of it really. too. Yeah, they just—it was just sort of throwing money at something. But you, you made a good <coughs> album, the Lost Weekend album. It was a good album. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, what Warner's deleted it after two years. I'm, but I've got good news for you, yeah. which you don't know this yet. We only heard yesterday. We've got the rights now to put it out on Cherry Red. Lost Weekend. Really? Warner's confirmed it yesterday afternoon. Yeah. So there you go. Be coming out finally on Cherry Red. Where really? it belongs. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 Oh my, well, I have to talk about that. Yeah, we yeah. will do afterwards, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, that's fantastic news. That's, that's super, I mean, it's, it's a good album, and it was, it was only released on, uh, there's, it's, it'll be on, like, P2P and, and Warren, all these sort of, like, file-sharing networks where you can get free MP3s or whatever, but it was only released on CD in Japan That's right. for about a yeah. year or something yeah. and it became ridiculously expensive yeah. and incredibly difficult to get. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's anyway. great. I always like that album, so I'm glad yeah. we got it out oh, of the It's great. It's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. 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 Um, and really it got we, 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 uh, kind of a there was one thing that, that um, persuaded us to go with Warners. There was one particular incident. We'd actually, if you recall, we'd actually recorded Lost Weekend. We started recording Lost Weekend on Cherry Red. And we started recording it, as far as I remember, on, with Cherry Red Money. Right. And the recording, the f initial recordings were sold. It wasn't like we were just... We, we actually... Uh, that album, or part of it, was sold to Warners along with the band. Yes. I think. I, I remember some money change hands, yeah. I forget all the details. No, yeah. I think that we'd actually started recording that album with the view of it being a Cherry Red release. Yes, yeah. And around about uh, the end of 83, we went on our last of three tours to America, which was a complete disaster. A lot of our gear got nicked. Yeah. And Andy and I just came back and said, let's just go for the money. He'd lost a lot of personal money as well, yeah. more than me. And we just, you know, in tears, actually, we virtually came back. So that also made a difference. But for our, for our longevity at the time, it was a mistake because when we saw what Warners were doing and the fact that we were seen by many fans to sell out, um, we just split up. Yeah. Mm. And... Uh, but, not, but not for too long, though. Not for too long because... No. Yeah, I mean, it has to be said that, uh, well, I, I mean, five years to me is not too long, <laughs> but I suppose some people would be. I, I mean, recorded uh, a couple of things for Cherry in between. Yeah, because I'm just, again, looking at the dates and discography. Lost Weekend came out in 85, and then just to follow the overview of the history, what mm. happened was that Mike Alway, who had been the Cherry Red A&R man and yeah. signed you both to Cherry Red and then signed you to Blanco Negro back yeah. by Warners, he, after about 18 months, he realised that Warners wasn't the place for him either. Yeah. And then he uh, came back to work with me at Trey Red, and that was when L Records started L, to... Uh, yeah. Started to... Yeah. to, 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 to and to, L take. itself is, you know, it kind of follows on, in a sense, from, from the... the, the the 82, 83 period of Cherry Red, because L itself was massively influential graphically, massively influential to to the, the the scene that would later become the indie pop scene. 
very influential in Japan exactly, and, and yeah. Yeah. influential later on yeah. indirectly with, with European labels, definitely. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I did some work with him then. Because you released a live album called Finn. Yeah. And um, I, have to, I remember, forget all the titles, so I'm looking mm -hmm. here, and there was, it was Westminster Affair, was a, yeah. again, it was a compilation album, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. 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 But you also did some solo things with. Uh, well, we did Reach for Your Gun. Which is under the uh, name of Bid, wasn't it? I that think. was just under the name of Bid. Yeah. And I sort of played or played, produced, I can't exactly remember, one or two um, of the L records, and we, the monochrome set. When, when was the the would be good right? the camera allows me that would have been probably around 87 I think 87 yeah I would guess so the the, the, the monochrome set who we still knew each other as Nick Veslovsky um, Fars Andy and myself we played on that album and then later on and then and then we kind of finally split up if you like and then later on I, I produced Mondo and Andy played on, on the Mondo album as a, a second Whoopi Goods album. And so we, we were still in contact with each other. We yes. Just, you know, it was around about the uh, late, very late 80s, we were contacted by, by uh, a Japanese... Um, I can't remember his name now. <laughs> in Final Japan. Right. <laughs> Japanese guy there. And uh, it was... I seem to recall... Because I, I seem to recall that, that um, a fairly high proportion of our sales, even from the early 80s, late 70s, were, were to Japan. Yes, well, we, they were licensed out there. Right. Uh, the, the thing about L Records was that it was, in the UK, got really well received in terms of press. Yeah. Often got singles of the week and big articles. Radio was very difficult. Yeah. Because they were regarded as pop records. Yeah yet the production didn't have the sophistication yeah. of a normal pop record, so we got very little radio. Yeah. But Japan really picked up on it, and most of the L albums were licensed yeah. uh, through a company called Toys Factory in, in Toys Japan, Factory, that's right, yeah. and sold out there. And there was even, I think there was an L tour. Were you on the L tour? I was on the L tour. No, there, I was, heard about it. <laughs> there was an L tour of Japan as well, which was... Uh, well, the, the thing is, I think that uh, something like 40% of the sales of Strange Boutique in, in the early, eight, in early 1980 were to Japan. Right. So, yeah. And I remember actually um, the head of Toys Factory being, or, or the head of, was it Toys Factory or the, or the, or the company that was just before Toys Factory? meeting him at the Cherry Road offices in around about 1983, and that's yes. probably when you were starting your association with Japan, or the, the Japanese... Yeah, well, I, I'd, I'd been out there before that, yeah. and sort of put some groundwork in, but yeah. so certainly the Jap they, they, they picked up on it, yeah. and it, visually they loved it, musically mm. they obviously yeah. liked it as well, and it was, it was the start of a whole, yeah. a whole genre out there, yeah. absolutely, oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely, hugely influential. And... Um, so when we, we were contacted by, but not Toys Factory initially at least, but by uh, an independent label, Vile Japan. It was yeah. really a guy with a, a two record shops who just made a fortune yeah. uh, selling a vinyl there. And he just wanted, actually initially, he just wanted Bid to do a tour there. Then I was starting to think, well, how about doing the monochrome set? And then I said, well, how about doing a monochrome set and an album? Yeah. And, you know, it seemed very natural to, to, to do that because it wasn't a new market, it was just a market that we'd never visited. Um, we'd always sold there. It all, it, it, as an individually as a country, it always been our biggest market, in fact. Yeah. And um, that's it. We really reformed for that country just to go there. You know? well, it wasn't really with the expectation of anything happening. But it was a fantastic first first tour. I think the first album sold sixteen thousand. So yeah. I mean, it was all right yeah. for an indie album. Yeah. I mean, we got to, um, we were the highest selling for a period of time, a few weeks, highest selling non-Japanese act in the Japanese national charts. Huh. So it was number forty two though only, because <laughs> you can't compete with Japanese bands. Sure. They sell millions. You sure. Know? I mean, you know, if you're not Japanese and you're not singing Japanese, you don't look Japanese, you're not going to mean half as much to Japanese yeah. people, so you can't really compete, and that's fair enough. 
But, uh, yeah, in the 40s, we, we shared the 40s with uh, Sting and Samantha Fox and the monochrome set were all That's there. great company. <laughs> So that album was, album was Dante's Casino, wasn't Dante's it? Dante's Casino, yeah. yeah. And that was a great tour. That was um, Beatles Hard Day's Night Tour. It was being chased down the street. Is that, re yeah, is that yeah, right, really? Well, when we, when we got to the airport, uh, we were standing in the queue to check in, and there were two girls, separate, who one of them who had a monogram set tape in a Walkman, and she was listening to it, and then she looked at us. And we had monogram set on our guitar cases. And the other one's a monochrome set fan as well. She, she subsequently came to the gig. So it was kind of, we thought, hang on a minute, this is weird, you know. It's uh, never happened to us in the UK. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty amazing. Yeah. And we sort of didn't really get much um, going on anywhere outside of Japan because it was rather difficult for us then. We, did, we couldn't really get a big agency. We weren't really going to... Um, touring was, is always really important to me. It's one of the main ways of uh, selling records is to tour. And it, and it still is, it always has been. Uh, we couldn't get a bit, ourselves a big agency, and it was before the, the days of the internet, because 10 years might not sound like a long time, but it's the dark ages as far as computer goes, you know, the yeah. mid-90s. So uh, we didn't know where all the best clubs in, in Bremen were, you know. You'd, have to, you'd need an agency to find that out. So we really hardly played in Europe at all, just a few gigs in the UK. And, we, uh, you know, again, we were even more the wrong sound, even more the wrong time. So it was really, we only really existed for Japan. Um, and that was kind of it. And when Japan dried out, pretty much in, in wherever it was, 95, 96, um, we split up. But you did have two more albums, Sherrod and Misere, didn't you? Well, which, we, which... we actually recorded, when we reformed in 90, we recorded five albums. We only recorded okay. four in the first period. I know everyone likes to talk about the first yeah, period, yeah. but we actually recorded more. You were more prolific. Yeah, then, yeah. We, we did Dante's Casino, Jack, um, Sherrod, Misere and Trinity Road. Right, yeah. And um, all of them, I think, have all of them ended up on Cherry Red? They have. Um, Dante's and Jack. I think did. Jack was on Honeymoon Records. Jack was on Honeymoon, yeah. And Vi and the Dante's has ended up on Cherry Red. As I think well. it's been. I think it's been reissued on Cherry right. Red. Right. Yeah. And the last three were actually recorded yeah. on Cherry Red. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And it made sense for us to go back to Cherry Red for for the. Yeah, yeah. and they all sold okay. It's nothing yeah. sensational, but obviously yeah. they all they all yeah. sold something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then after that, it finally was. Well, I think you said earlier you had, you did reform for um, two gigs in Greece, didn't you? Yeah, we we split up mainly because really when when Japan stopped, Japan was fun, and when that stopped, it wasn't fun anymore because what we were doing outside of Japan was was playing pubs in Camden, and yeah. you know uh, we've done that for, for whatever twenty yeah. years. We're not going to do that again. What's the point? Um, we didn't really, we didn't have management, I suppose we, I think it was probably the wrong time to reform, maybe it was too early or something, whatever, you know. But uh, we, we didn't want to do tremolos and end up playing, you know, ferries from, from uh, London to, to or, or from Harwich to Vlessingen or whatever, yeah. um, playing old hits. So we, we pretty much... Um, split up soon after Trinity Road, because it was obvious that Japan had dried up. <clears throat> but we did kind of get together, I wouldn't say it was reformed, we got together again a couple of years later to play a couple of gigs in, in Athens, just because yeah. we were asked to, and, and we didn't need much rehearsal, we were still vaguely rehearsed, pickled. Um, and then that was it, but we knew that those two gigs were going to be the last. And then... It was Scarlet's Web, which is your current... Scarlet's uh, Well. <laughs> Scarlet's Well, I'm sorry, yeah. Scarlet's Web, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> and Scarlet's Well, um, I carried on working with Mike, Mike Orway. Yeah. Producing stuff, or doing things with him. And um, there was an album, Songs from the Jet Set, volume one, which was made for... I can't remember who, a uh, Japanese company, Polystar or something, no, maybe not Polystar... Um, and I just wanted to get a band together, but a band together which wasn't really a band, which was just a bunch of people or a, or a sort of an idea, and that, that's what Scarlet's Well is. But the connection with the monochrome says is, is there are 
a lot of songs on Scarlet's Records which were f shelf monogram set records. Right, yeah. Um, uh, songs, I mean. Um, I mean, bands have songs which, for some reason, they don't work at the time. No particular reason. That, that there's no sort of uh, qualitative reason that you don't play them. They just don't work with the, in the studio, with the equipment, the this or that. There was one song called Miss Twinkle, which went on the first Scarlet's World album, which was actually recorded, nearly fully recorded for the Lost Weekend album, but didn't go on the album. We didn't, in those days, we didn't have orchestras and we didn't have good digital samples of orchestras. It's really weird to me when you think back that, you know, it's actually no, it, not that long ago that you, you actually had to hire an orchestra. Yeah. Nowadays, you can yeah, look about yeah, the computer, but you yeah. actually had to get in, yeah. you know, real musicians, and we couldn't do that, so mm -hmm. it didn't go on the album. Yeah. So there are things like that. The latest Girls were album. Um, there's actually one of the songs is, is a song that I wrote in early 77, huh. which has just been hanging around and I just yeah. completely forgot about. Yeah. It's, a, it's a good song, but I, mean, I can't remember why, you know. So, so and the ironical thing is that Here's Frank, your first single, yeah. has now had a, a return as a song. Yeah, well, I, I was told that uh, Norman Cook, was it when he was in the House Martins, they, 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 they did an album of cover versions and they'd planned to do He's Frank then. Okay. And that's the connection. And that, uh, so, you know, I guess when he wanted, he was going to do this, this album this year and it was sort of gone through various morphs of, of name change and, and song name change and band name change and participants in that album. And then Iggy Poppers ended up singing it. And I think they're doing di various different versions of so it. So when you, when you heard the Iggy Pop version of Here's Frank, what did you think? Well, it's kind of weird, you know, because obviously he was already iconic when, when I was uh, starting the monochrome set, although there's only 10 years difference between us. Yeah. that We were a sort of, you know, late 70s band and they're a late 60s band. Um, but to me, he's like, you know, one it's of the bosses. It's quite flattering in one way then, isn't oh, yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. 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 But... Um, and so Norman Cook has produced an album with this song on there. Yeah. And it's also featured, I forget the name of the TV series. Heroes. Heroes, it's yeah. featured in Heroes. I don't watch it either. <laughs> <laughs> and it's on the soundtrack apparently too. Yeah, it soundtrack. was on the soundtrack album which has already been released. And, and uh, the, I think that the He's Frank has already been released as some sort of MP3 download or something in America. Right. Uh, it was going to be a single, but maybe, I don't know, maybe single don't sell now, maybe it's all MP3, this and that. But um, I think maybe because if they didn't want to release it as a single because it was already been on the Heroes thing, it was just going to be a, a, a lead into their album, Brighton Port Authority album. Yes, yeah. And so they've been playing it a lot live and that, that's the sort of lead in. I think they're going to have David Byrne on the album as well. And, so there's a few characters on that album. I yeah, think. so it's an album hopefully will come out at some point. And it was meant to come out this, this coming autumn, yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Should be. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and Andy Warren is uh, in the wood playing with the Woodby Goods? He's, he joined the Woodby Goods about three years ago. Yeah. And he's done... He, they've got an album out now, I think, is it the first album he's done or the second? Possibly the first, I don't know. But they're actually playing with them on the Creme set. In in November, mid, mid November, yeah. 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 Um, so they'll not be the monochrome set. Like, they're playing with Scarlet's Well. No, no, sorry, not the monochrome set. Scarlet's Well, yeah. <laughs> because there is possibly a monochrome set thing. Because is there not a thirtieth anniversary coincidentally of both? There's a private party with the monochrome set playing out a reformed uh, there is a anniversary yes. edition version. Yeah, it's um, I only found out this year that that uh, as it happens, the coincidence of it being a 30th anniversary for both Jerry and yeah, my crew. Yeah, so, absolutely. So there you go. And so 30 years, 30 years on, you're still enjoying what you're doing, you're oh, still yeah. enjoying your music, and it sounds like you're doing very much with Scarlet's Well what you were doing with the monochrome set in terms that you're the motivator and Just getting trying to have fun. And, yeah. Really. Yeah. You know, I mean, what, what, once you throw out the idea that you're going to actually have a yacht, <laughs> then you really start to have yeah. fun. You do. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. And, you know, trying to impress that upon um, sort of younger bands that I come across, just like 
it's doing it because yeah. you want to do it, not with the end result of fame and fortune. It's yeah, just enjoying it. Yeah, I, th I think it. so. I mean, I see, you know, I mean, even Franz Ferdinand, you know, because I've, I've produced the, the pre-Fat Franz Ferdinand um, band album, who were called the Blisters, the Corellia. So I sort of know Alex and la, la, and then they had... Oh, it's just a shock to see him suddenly on TV, <laughs> playing his... <laughs> Hang on a minute, I know him. Uh -huh. um, suddenly, but they released like six or seven singles, and then, blah, blah, you know, I think, oh, well, that's a little bit much, going a bit crazy, isn't it? But, I mean, he's been hoping for success a long time, but d does it come too much? Is, it, is there too much? Or I speak to him on the phone and say, well, and he says he's, he's touring around... Um, the US and, and Germany in a tour bus. I said, what's your next album going to be out? It's going to be about touring, isn't it? You're writing all your next album songs on the tour bus. Yeah. And he says, no, 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 it's really not. And it is. And that's the thing. Right. Yeah. You know? And actually a lot of it, I can see in the lyrics, a lot of it is about being on the road and fans and blah, blah, blah. And that's what you get into. Yeah. And you start thinking and objectively, if you want to go into a profession just to make money, become a lawyer <laughs> just you know because <laughs> your chances of making yeah. money yeah. in the music business are very very low yeah. because once you get into the heavily commercial side you lose so much of your own soul that you may as well be the lawyer <laughs> no, i did not tell me like that but um you lose more of yourself than, yeah. than virtually any other profession i could think of because as an actor, you're doing it deliberately and you keep a part of yourself yeah. inside. But in the commercial end of the music business, you don't realise that you've lost so much of yourself. Yeah. You suddenly, it comes to you. You know, you've lost a part of your life. So I don't really like that. I like okay. it for it to be fun and I like to play small clubs and have a lot of fun with the people there. No, sounds good and yeah. that's what you've done and you've yeah. stuck to your values, yeah. Mm. OK, Bid, thanks for coming in. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for watching Cherry Red TV and we'll see you again soon. Goodbye.